I want to hear what you have to say about the <laughs> the Matrix Resurrections. Did you like it? First of all, I loved it. I, oh, I great! Super, super loved it. That's great. Um, what did you love about it? Uh, I love that it had something to say, and and made that made a fair amount of points fairly fairly effectively. Um, I loved that it it didn't. I'm trying to think of how to say this. It contained um, an expression from the creator that it, yeah, I resonated yeah, yeah. with. Yeah. Um, I I I kind of like that. It took a lot of the themes of the show and made them mean something else in context. It sort Wait. of it sort of redefined what the Matrix means in the context of the Matrix. What do you mean the show? You mean that? You mean the movie? A movie. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, dude, are you talking about the Animatrix? <laughs> I mean, we can, but that's largely immaterial, I think. Those are just, <laughs> it's an anthology, right? Side story stuff. No, yeah, but, but the, yeah, but the, you mean the original movie, or I guess maybe the three movies? Yeah, the original trilogy, which kind of you can separate the original and then the next two, but, um, what else? I, I thought it was a very colorful film. Oh, uh, it was. It really was. Yeah. I thought, let me think, what other good things about it? There were, I mean, there were some not good things, I think, that, sure. that most people who watch it can identify pretty quickly. Um, but let me think. Hmm. It, it kind of like, uh, kind of like I was saying, the counterpoint to No Way Home is that it gave me a whole lot to think about, a whole lot to chew on, a whole lot to examine about my own life. Hmm. Um, and, wow. it, and it's kind of resided in my head. There are individual lines in there, too, that mean a whole lot. Um, there's actually a whole lot of lore and world building that happens very 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 quickly it does like one or two lines <laughs> yeah that yeah that you really have to kind of think and parse in in context of the universe um there's a whole lot that reads a whole lot different when you watch it again and kind of know some of the some of the like lore gimmicks that are revealed halfway through the movie mm. um and i think ultimately even though i think it didn't necessarily execute the love story perfectly the idea that that like neo and trinity are are like their beings are in love regardless of how they look or what what body they're in their souls it's pretty sweet it's their yeah. souls yeah. yes mm -hmm. yeah. and that that has persisted across uh being reborn and re reanimated and resurrected Remade. yeah yeah so that that's nice i guess no um, i like i actually really like that a lot Lawrence. I, I that was my favorite part of the film yeah, the love story part. I, I really I liked that. I thought that was uh, I thought it was a really sweet thing that that honestly, I thought the first Matrix kind of glossed over because if you remember, Trinity brought Neo back because she loved him. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and I was always like, wow, what? Hey, that's part of the world. And they they gloss over it very quickly. And then he's back and then he fights and wins. But in this movie, they really explain why that works, which I thought was cool. Oh yeah, they they gave lore rules to their love and like the energy generating pr principles of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I liked. I thought I again in the in the first Matrix they didn't give that they didn't give it enough. Uh, they didn't give a love story enough when they used it <laughs> to bring back the main hero. Um, but the, but in this movie they explain. Oh, okay. Although this is this is why it works. It's because they're always like you said, their souls are always in love. Yeah, yeah. There's um, man. There's a lot of good. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, have, what? So what did it? What questions did it ask you about your own life that you had to chew on later? I'm curious. Uh, let's see. I think it. I think it asks the audience to examine their relationship with the entertainment they like uh, and why they like it. I think it. I think it. It implores the audience to ask a little more of the the media and the artwork they take in. Mm -hmm. Um. I think it. Uh, what I appreciated, I think, is that it, part of it was a sort of personal message, of like here, here was my experience making the Matrix and and seeing the world react to it. Right. Um, I appreciated right. that quite a bit because I've always been curious about that. There's, there, it's one thing to like, to to take in a work from an artist, that, and it, it's another one to see a work that was so massively influential and like fueled the whole zeitgeist. Like there were idiots walking around with trench coats and stupid glasses for a while after the matrix <laughs> yeah. yeah 
But it's what I've, what I've always appreciated, especially about Matrix 2 and 3, is that much like Matrix 4, they could have just done another movie with more of the thing that mm -hmm. most audiences liked. Mm -hmm. And they did. They, they served that in Matrix 2 especially. I mean, there were like crazy action sequences, ridiculous computer animation. Like it had all that stuff. But they also, God bless them, decided to make it a philosophical treatise on like science fiction in general and free will and predetermination. And they wrapped all these things in there um, that to, for most people just made it unnecessarily bloated and, and pretentious. Uh, but I was I was super into it because at the time, those were a lot of the things I was wrestling with is uh, my my own free will. Uh, what what makes a person, you know, actualized, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was super into it. I think similarly, now being much older, I wonder about my life and what gives it meaning and significance. Mm -hmm. um, is is my life just moving from one pop culture movie where people in spandex punch each other to the next and that's that's what I have to look forward to? Right. Um, <laughs> so the I think the movie makes a pretty powerful counter argument to that, that like there is a rich world of meaning out there you just have to kind of step outside of the predetermined day to day. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's great. Um, I'm, I, uh, I can safely say that I got all of those concepts. the the same that you did from this movie. Um, and I thought it was nice that they try that specifically, probably Lana Wachowski tried to, um, not answer those questions, but ask them at least in the in the film. What that you know, having people sit around a boardroom talking about <laughs> uh, their work of art, and this is going to sound kind of weird, but it, it it's interesting to, to say. Oh yeah, the director was was re was self reflecting on like how people saw their film, but <laughs> all I could think about. <laughs> You tell me if you've heard the story. All I could think about was Will Smith talking about how this movie was pitched to him. Have you ever heard that story? Uh, no. The okay. original? No, no. Yeah. So you know how Will Smith was going to be Neo in The huh? Matrix? Apparently, the Wachowskis went to Will Smith and they pitched the movie to Will Smith uh, thusly. They said... <laughs> This is because this is Will Smith. Will Smith tells it better, obviously, because it was pitched to him. But this is so this is secondhand through Will Smith. And he says the Wachowskis were like, there's going to be 300 cameras around you as you jump up in the air and do a Kung Fu move. And the special effects will then sh basically they'll do a, a, a circle around you as you do it. And you're going to be like, and again, this is all off the top of my head. And you're going to be blocking bullets and uh, doing karate moves and like they were talking about they were pitching the movie as an action film to Will Smith. Yeah, because they're trying to, I mean, from an actor's perspective, that's probably what right, right. would sell him on the movie. Um, it didn't, obviously. And those were those uh, were the kinds of roles he was taking at the time too. Yeah, and so so to me, I was like, I wonder if if that's what, if they if that was the way they viewed their film mm. then, and then once it came out and everybody released and everybody wrote all their essays about it. <laughs> then, <laughs> then they were like, oh, okay. wait a minute. I did make a movie that was really thought provoking. I don't know. I'm not mm. sure. Uh, wasn't this based on a comic too, Lawrence or no? Was it, was it, or, I, it, I'm, or was this, it is, I'm not aware. Was I it mean, a complete it's, it's original work of art? I wasn't sure. I mean, it's chock full of like spiritual references to other cyberpunk works. That's for sure. Based on a book. Um, okay. Oh, it is based on a book. Yeah. It was, it was oh, something, right. it was based on something that, um, cause I thought it wasn't completely original. That said, by the way, I love the first matrix, love it. And was an apologist for the second matrix. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted, I wanted so badly to be reloaded, reloaded to be good. Uh, that I, you know, got in lengthy arguments with my friends about it. Uh, cause I was like, isn't it cool that the matrix was already done six times? Like, wow. And nobody thought it was cool. Um, uh, <laughs> I was an apologist for that. And so by the third, when the third one came out, I was like, "Ugh, damn it. <laughs> Fuck. I really, really wanted revolutions to wrap that up. And it did not. But how did you feel about the first or I guess? Yeah. Tell me how you thought about, felt about the first three. I'm curious to hear those. 
I mean, the first one is is a it's masterful, extremely yeah, it's an extremely yeah. formative, but kind of by the numbers hero's journey. Um, the the philosophical implications are are fun but light. Uh, about, I mean, it is it is it does dip into like Plato Plato's parable of the cave territory, which is fun. That's right. Maybe trying to to convince people that their perception is not truth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah something that god the world could probably stand and hear a little more of these days <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh yeah. but yeah it's for me it was really two and three that that made me fall in love with the wachowskis as filmmakers hmm. because uh they bit off so much more than they needed to now to your point maybe maybe the runaway success did give them the pressure to like make the sequels mean more than they did kind of thing or mean more than they needed to mm -hmm. but uh it worked for me and I think I think their films since then have have been uh, somewhat in line with that. I don't think their films are ever just like a hundred percent audience pleasing. They always put something from them in there. They do. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. So I kind of that's that's kind of what I take away is that like I mean, it's like Cloud Atlas is a is an incredible incredible movie. <laughs> probably probably the most watchable one. Um, <laughs> Because man, I've tried to make people watch Speed Racer, and people don't have it. They, oh, I they're not I, down with it. I loved Speed Racer when I saw it. I was a big fan of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Most people. Most people. Most people just get, I guess, visually uh, overwhelmed. Maybe is the word. I got that movie's got a lot going on. It's it it it, uh, it does. It's it doesn't make sense as a film. It makes sense as like a piece of edited content. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, it, it's an editing showcase more than yeah, more but it's than great. A movie. But it's great. And and also Cloud Atlas, I had just read the book, so it was perfect. Ooh, I, read, wow. I, I read the book and then I went and saw the movie and I was like, and I so I knew immediately what was going on. So a lot of people are like, man, Cloud Atlas so fucking confusing. I got exactly the right experience for Cloud Atlas. Right on. Yeah. But. Uh, see here. Uh, but let's see here. In terms of just my evaluation of the movies. Yeah, I was I was really blown away by Matrix 2. Gave me a lot to think about. Had a lot more kind of crowd pleasing segments in it. Three is a really fascinating movie, but it's not easy to watch. It's <laughs> it is a downer of a movie. Yeah. It's like everyone's dying and and it's even more kind of philosophically crazy. I do appreciate that they teed up a really hard question and then answered it or got close to answering it mm -hmm. um, between like, you know, what's the like, is it free will? Is it determination? Right. What right. happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable, immovable object kind of thing? Yeah. So I appreciated the in, intent and the execution, even if I, I haven't really watched Revolutions a whole lot um, because it, <laughs> is, it is just a hard watch. It really, um, it really is. And, uh, I, and it's I, like, man, ugh. the CG is probably dated the most in that one. So. Well, that all those Agent Smiths and Reloaded look like trash. Oh man! Oh, yeah, they're man. gummy men now. At least the at least the imagination of the choreography kind of sold that sequence more than the CG has held that, up. That's that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, because I went to watch. I'm really enjoying Reloaded in the theater, and then I went to watch Reloaded like a few years ago, and I was like, oh fuck! Like they all look like uh, the Scorpion King. Yeah. They're all bl they're all blobby Play-Doh boys. <laughs> yeah, they sure are. But yeah. man, that music though, huh? That Juno reactor pounding in your ears. It was mm. great. It was great. That soundtrack's mm. awesome. Yeah, that soundtrack's awesome. Um, but anyways, back back to the Matrix Resurrections. Yeah, I uh, it felt like uh, like you I what you all I think what you said is true about Wachowski's basically like trying to ask a bunch of new questions about their property, which I thought was cool. I appreciated that. It wasn't just a rehash, um, but I also thought it was lighter than Reloaded and Revolutions. I thought it, it felt to me like this was like, then we're not going to take it as seriously. Um, th did you get that sense or no? I did. I did. Yeah, there was it was it was a bit more playful because uh, I I get the sense that they 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 did the thing like they they already made Matrix two and three. There's no reason to be so self-serious now, mm -hmm. especially because just on the surface level, I think the movie understands that it's kind of ridiculous that there is a matrix for. So I think the whole movie is kind of approaching itself from that perspective of like, why are we here? Um, so it can be a little more flippant, I think with its tone. Yeah. Uh, no, the meta aspects for me did not take me out of the story. It sounds like Lawrence liked them. I, I like that kind of stuff. I think it's fun. Uh, I do too. Yeah. I think some people thought that 
like the meta stuff was unrealistic, but it's not. Um, it's really not. Like, so I, I know a lot of people reacted pretty strongly to the boardroom scenes and thought it was cringe, but that's how that's how people talk it in is. those boardrooms. It is where they just yeah. sit around for for months doing no work. Like that's that's an that's an idea person room, and they exist and they're real. And if you like, if you ever wonder why people who have some amount of artistic success and never make anything. It's because they're just basically doing that all the time. Lawrence speaks uh, the truth here. So if you've not experienced that, we have. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, yeah, they were playing, you know, I guess like uh, exaggerated versions of themselves in that boardroom. But I promise you, I have been in boardrooms like that where they, that where, they where they're saying, uh, you know, like bullet time. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> and all and on all of the people sitting around the table being like, fuck, what the fuck are we going to do? This person's just saying a phrase over and over. That doesn't mean we can do something. Um, oh, what about so. the projected movies of the first films? I mean, they, they said it in the scene. They're talking to you, the audience, when Morpheus is like, some nostalgia helps ease the transition. They're transitioning you into the actual movie at that point because you're exiting the Matrix finally again. Um, but that's when that's when the movie like drops its cynicism but there's some times where the characters talk to you the audience when when the analyst slash neil patrick harris's character holds up the apple for the bullet time shot he's like here here audience are you happy oh we yeah did the thing yeah um and i get how audience members could like feel like they're being spited by that like the the last jedi sort of sensation of you think you went star wars but we're gonna do the opposite so I kind of get that. Um, I didn't necessarily have that reaction because I didn't want another Matrix. Uh, and also I expect Matrix to be heady, whereas Star Wars isn't or isn't supposed to be or typically hasn't been. So I th that was that was my read on it is like that was kind of in there for people who desperately needed to see old Matrix again. Hmm, that's a good way to put it. I would no. also kind of make context in the story, too, of of like they're trying well, to well, let me ask you run on Neo. Let me ask you this. Well, for, first, I want to address Seabrad in the chat. Seabrad, you don't need to watch it again, by the way. You are not wrong. If you didn't like the boardroom shit, that's totally fine. Like, you feel free to not like it. It's okay. I'm just telling you, we've, uh, we've been through that. Um, but I can see why it feels cringe, because it is cringe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, re in real life, it is cringe. Um, no, I was, I was assuming that the projected scenes that were they were showing in the movie from the previous films were from the video game he made. Am I wrong? So yeah, that was the context of it is that in that version of the Matrix, the the movie was a game that people played, which is weird because I feel like at some point in the concepting of this movie, they were going to have scenes from the movie rendered in a video game engine, which might be what the Matrix Awakens was alluding to. Um that that demo that you can download, the tech demo. Oh yeah. So that Yes, yes. I think that might have tried that at some point, maybe that was supposed to be the technical wow factor of this matrix is that all the matrix one scenes were rendered in an engine. I could see that being like the concept at some point. Clearly it didn't make it through to execution, but uh, there's a couple like that leads to a couple of things that I think are just, just amazing that in, so in matrix one, essentially a dude gets courted by a hot girl in latex and gets to lead a cool superhero hacker lifestyle, which is just like a really kind of surface level fantasy for a lot of, a lot of <laughs> boring white dudes, <laughs> but like myself included, by the way. But uh, in Matrix 4, a dude makes a video game. The video game characters come to life and tell him that he can go into the video game and be a digital god in there. That's the premise of the movie, even though it's buried under a lot of layers of meta irony. And that's the dumbest fucking thing. That's like the most surface level fantasy. That's a very 90s movie um, that I thought was amazing. Well, wait, hold on. I hold really, on. really liked that. You're, you're blowing my mind because, wait, hold on. So uh, let, me, let me get this straight. So first, they resurrect Neo and Trinity. They both die, right, in Revolutions. They resurrect yeah. them. They put them back into a new Matrix that Neil, Neil Patrick Harris has designed. Mm -hmm. And then in order for... Neil Patrick Harris to find something for Neo to do in his matrix. Uh, Neo then makes a video game about his previous memories from a previous matrix. Is that correct? A uh, sort of, um, I don't know that that timeline played out like that. 
I think I think Neo is just Tom Anderson with like that backstory sort of implanted. Uh, oh, okay, all right. I think the as the the aspect about the game coming to life is that he made his modal, which is right. like a matrix inside the matrix. He made a simulation of the Matrix One that was running on his machine, which is where the movie starts. Which, by the way, is another meta irony thing. When Matrix Two and Three were going to come out, I remember everybody was sort of speculating that there would be another Matrix. Like that was supposed to be the twist of the third movie is that the reason Neo can shoot, can beam down robots with his mind. Right. Cause they were in a matrix. The real world yeah. is another matrix. I remember that. Yeah. But yeah. But at the intro of matrix four, it actually starts in a simulation inside the matrix. So it is two matrixes deep. They actually did that, but it, it like they did it in a way that didn't like, wasn't immediately obvious. So I thought it was fun that they took that expectation and used it just in a way that was completely different than people were expecting. So the characters, all right, hold on. Because now I'm now I'm confused. <laughs> because if the if the characters then were in the mode, so for example, uh, Lawrence Fishburne or uh, what's his name, Yaya, uh, the guy that plays Morpheus, he is he is a basically a digital uh, projection made up of nano machines in the real world, right? Yes, but he is, he- but what about bugs? If Bugs came from the Matrix that Tom Anderson designed, how is Bugs real in the real world? Bugs is from the Matrix that the machines designed. But Morpheus bu- is from the simulation of Matrix 1 that Tom Anderson made. But, so Bugs is still real, but, but Bugs was from the Matrix that was in the Neil Patrick Harris Matrix, right? Yes. yes. Okay, good. All right. That's what, so they, they basically found each other is what happened. More, yeah, Bugs found Morpheus. Um, in the, in the modal, in the modal. Yes. And Morpheus was an, uh, Morpheus is a matrix one agent because there aren't really agents anymore either. Now they just use bots. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, Neo or Tom Anderson made a recreation of matrix one, hoping that somehow by recreating it, he would figure out why he doesn't feel like he belongs. Correct. Yeah. And it ended up working. Uh, bugs found it and, in so doing, discovered that one of the agents had become sentient and was the new Morpheus, basically. That's my understanding of it anyway. That, sound, that sounds right. I th- okay, so yeah, we're on the same page. Because like, I thought you were going to blow my mind and say that Bugs wasn't real. I was like, what the fuck? But, um, I'm pretty sure Bugs is real. Yeah, but, I, but that makes a lot of sense now that I think about it. Because I only saw it once again. You saw, you saw it twice. So I think you have a better understanding. Um, yeah, uh, King Saren said, Lawrence explaining this makes sense. Watching the movie, this isn't clear. And I would agree. Um, I was along for the ride and was really trying to understand. And I thought that I did. It sounds like I pretty much did. Um, but I think if, as the more we talk about it, I'm sure I'll have more questions for you, Lawrence. Uh, There's, yeah, there, like I said, there are, they do so much story and lore explaining with like two lines and then the movie moves on. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, it makes, it actually does kind of click, but it does require you to kind of like, limber up your brain about reality and digital things being real um so yeah the the movie is actually pretty heady in terms of its like science fiction trappings Mm -hmm. uh but yeah when you watch it the first time you're kind of distracted by all the meta irony and shit yeah um i will i like i again i was kind of like i felt i felt like i could understand what was going on even and i was just happy to except the nano machines made up Morpheus and that we were also friends with machines who joined our rebellion, which I, by the way, th- thought was totally real. I, I, that was something to me that could totally happen if we had a war with machines. And then there were a few machines that had decided, you know what? I don't want to fight for the machines. I want to fight for the humans. I, that was cool. Um, I liked that little piece of the lore they added. Uh, yeah. and so, Oh, okay. Let me ask you this. Uh, why could why did why was neo not able to get his powers back but then trinity could fly at the end but not neo and then eventually they both flew why did that happen um presume well that, that i think that's in the realm of theory uh oh okay all right i wasn't sure if you had a like an actual answer for, for me or the, not honestly the best answer and one that might be a scapegoat might not is that in the in the thoroughly contrived confrontation between Neo and and uh, New Smith? Mm-hmm. 
Um, they fight for a little bit. And then Smith is like, you changed. You lost something. And Neo was like, you're right. I'm not, I'm not that guy anymore. So you could read into it like Neo is older now and he doesn't have that. What I read into that is that he doesn't have that kind of rage against the machine fuck everything up energy anymore yeah. <laughs> um which you can also read into the the fight between you know the air quotes fight between him and morpheus and the dojo training throwback sequence neo just neo doesn't really fight anymore in any of the scenes sure um, he doesn't it's still, yeah it'd be tempting right. to say that like oh he like keanu reeves is older but we've seen john wick so like we know that he can i actually think it might be a writing thing neo is a pacifist um so i think and, and i think he also kind of he's not the one anymore, even though the one wasn't even really a thing ever. It was just a, another element of control kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess he didn't believe, didn't know how, forgot how, willingly forgot how to manipulate the matrix like that. Like he still could to some degree, but he just didn't have the juice anymore. And Trinity did, I guess. Yeah, why, that's that's why really did the best I got. Why did Trinity? <laughs> I mean, why did Neo in the first movie? Uh, I think, I think, I well, think but, at that point, it's just kind of like she is the one. Um, well, yeah, because the, the, now, I mean, I guess Neo, Neo did it in the first movie because they had they had to designate a one. That was like their basically it was like a bug in the Matrix, right? Wasn't that the lore? Is that every Matrix yeah, had to I mean, have a one? Sorta. Uh, yeah, I guess. I guess in context of Matrix two and three the one exists to sort of define the undefinable aspect of humanity, which ended up being free will. So Neo is the one man they grant free will so that he can run around in the matrix, have right. human experiences and then reintegrate. So the, so the machines can better learn how to understand humanity. Right. Um, right. So theoretically that happened again, although from how the analyst talks, they don't really do that anymore. It's really just keeping them close, but separate. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, which now way, it just seems like, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, which sounds like, uh, it sounds like retconning, but if you go back and watch the other matrixes, then I guess it kind of makes sense because truly, even though the, well, pff, the story tells you over and over, he's the one, but in this one, in resurrections, they say, no, no, it's both of them. Um, and I think that's cool, but I mean, there's also a line in, in resurrections of Neo saying, I didn't ever believe I was the one either. Um, because the, like the one is not really a thing uh as teed up by the second and third movie it's just something that it's like a legend that they make up so that everyone in the matrix buys into it well wait hold on lawrence but why did why could he control machines outside of the matrix and revolutions <laughs> yeah that that i never really actually wrapped my head around <laughs> I, um, I don't I, think anybody could i so i wanted an answer to that question for years <laughs> <laughs> the closest that comes to is there are, there are schools of philosophy that kind of kind of play those parable of cave kind of kind of thing where once you understand that reality is a reflection of something else if you can grasp that ultimate truth if you can understand how to bend not only your own perception but others then you do get the powers of a god in any reality so i think that's what they were alluding to wow uh, okay yeah is that is that once you understand actual universal truth and and become fully actualized that with the powers of your mind so that's supernatural because, that's yeah, not that's not yeah. sci-fi anymore that's supernatural yeah it's it's just like it's it's like almost it's like borderline drugged out philip k dick science fiction essentially <laughs> or or honestly it's uh like reaching full enlightenment that's what it is um, yeah yeah exactly yeah so that was that was the whole idea is that yeah neo is Neo is the one actualized man, the only man that actually has free will. He he can rise above his status as being a slave to his his circumstances and his uh yeah and his uh, upbringing or whatever. He can choose, which is you know it's the it's the final line between him and Smith, and Smith who is a slave to his his purpose, dies once he loses his purpose, which is to kill Neo. So by sacrificing himself, he has undone Smith, except now he hasn't. So you know. <laughs> well, I, so, yeah, I was going to say, so, so sorry, I didn't mean to derail us on the revolutions, but I was, the reason I'm asking is because in this movie, it feels like Resurrections is trying to tell us, well, there isn't the one, we need both Neo and Trinity. And as long as Neo and Trinity are both there, then, uh, you know, they have the power to change things or not. If, if the analysts can keep them, you know, under control, is that right? 
Yeah. And, and there, there are schools of thought and, and like, like you said, literary, literary analyses of the matrix films that basically posit that Neo and Trinity are one person split into two. Um, so by uniting, then mm. they become a full person capable of love and completeness. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, which she's called Trinity. So really it's, it's Neo Trinity and Smith that form a complete person. Sure. Um, which is kind of why Smith is still around and, and says things like you never appreciated our relationship because Smith is actually a part of Neo kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There, there, there are parts where the matrix very willingly, I think goes off into, uh, non-specifics in terms of its characters and what they can do and why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. And then Scott, yeah. Scott brings up a good point in chat about how Neo and Trinity have to be together because there's a lot of binary talk in, in matrix four. The, actually, the game that that Thomas Anderson was working on before he woke up again was called Binary. So there's a lot of that imagery, oh, okay. too. Cool. Um, yeah, I saw somebody in chat, my chat, say, uh, I didn't really get any of this, but I still liked it. And I think the movie is likable. I think it's fun to watch. Uh, I was bummed that there weren't any really good action scenes. Like that was, and you know, that's obviously, a, I'm, uh, I'm in the, I'm in the boardroom talking about bullet time, but I was bummed that I didn't get at least a little bit of matrix action. Um, and there was a, there was a little bit of it, but it, it didn't feel, it didn't feel quite like the, uh, wide, wide shot, you know, 30 second choreographed fight that we would mm -hmm. get from the other matrix. I, I don't know if you felt that way. I did. I mean, I was, I was disappointed. Like I think a lot of people were, um, what I think what was more confusing to me is that some of the some of the um some of the cinematography was just a little off. Like mm -hmm. uh, there was some of that where like in the in the scene where like uh, Morpheus busts in to the office and they have their like office shootout that's sort of grandly referential to the uh to the finale of the first movie, like mm -hmm. the slow motion rain and everything. Morpheus is out there like doing flips and stuff, but a lot of them are like weirdly off camera. Like half of his body's off camera while he's doing these cool matrix flips. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. what? Why didn't you just frame him correctly? <laughs> so there, there's some weirdness there for sure. Now that said, uh, if you go back to the original matrix, I, how recently have you, have you rewatched it? That's a good question. I, it, it's maybe like two, three years ago. I mean, a lot of it holds up and there's, there's some really, really excellent, uh, fights and, and cinematography in there but i think i think the weight of a lot of it kind of wrote on the back of the the like meaning of the scenes which is completely different in this movie so like the dojo fight was rad because it was like it was the first time you were seeing uh matrix kung fu mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you've already seen it so like i went back and watched that movie or sorry watched yeah matrix one and a lot of the a lot of that stuff is still really really cool um but uh, if if that were in Matrix Four, I think it still would have disappointed people. Um, hmm, maybe I mean the, the Neo versus Smith fight. If there was something on that level, in Matrix, people would have been satisfied. But a lot of the stuff that they did in Matrix One, like if you take out Bullet Time, which the movie almost intentionally said it wasn't going to do, yeah, then yeah. you basically have the dojo fight. You have the lobby shootout, which was no, that was all Bullet Time. Never mind. Um, and then you just have the big set pieces like the helicopter blowing up and stuff like that. So, right. Right. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, I think you're right. I think you're right. I agree with you. There were, there were a couple scenes that still stand out to me from reloaded and revolutions. One of which is the fight of him fighting, uh, the key master. I think its name is, uh, you fought the key master. I mean, Seraph. Sarah, Sarah the, that's who it is. Yeah, Sarah. I yeah, don't know. The, I, I remember that, that one was dope as hell. Yeah, I remember that fight being fucking rad. Um, and because uh, that was again like it's a wide shot, and they have they spent weeks clearly choreographing that fight, and it looked great. And I didn't really get many of those in this one. Uh, so I wasn't even looking for bullet time or anything. I was just kind of looking for for cool choreographed fights because I there aren't many movies that do those. Even now. Um, and I always mm -hmm. thought I always thought the Matrix did those so well, even when they were 
you know, fully deep in the Matrix lore. I, I thought that those fights were always done really, really well. And like the only only other fights I can really think of like that are, you know, talking about the raid or um, the lightsaber fight in uh, Phantom Menace or those those sorts of really fucking cool single take choreographed fights. So they, I just didn't get that. That was just for me. That's just that's just a personal thing. That wasn't like, you know, they didn't need to fulfill that for me to like the movie. It's just something I thought about. No, I, I agree. I would have been cool to to have that element back. Um, I think I think the movie said pretty clearly that it wasn't well. And and this is where I feel like audiences could feel like they were being spited, which makes sense to me. But I think the movie <laughs> kind of tried to say it wasn't trying to be that. But then there were action sequences that were OK, which is odd. Like probably yeah. the coolest stunt in the whole thing was was Neo doing like the double wall run kick, which was kind of neat. Yeah. Um yeah. and then like the the supporting actors when and again pretty pretty superfluous scene but when Merovingian comes back and brings a lot of weirdos to just fight for no reason. <laughs> um the supporting cast there's some like there's some pretty decent side takes of them tossing up with some stunt performers. There it's are. not the like it's not the Hong Kong action. It is a little more like kind of North America action sequence but they're not yeah. the worst. Yeah. Uh and then but I do think I think yeah it didn't didn't meet expectations in that regard for sure. It's uh, I was really excited to see the Merovingian by the way because I really like that character, yeah. and I I could not hear a word that motherfucker said. I yeah he he had a bunch of shit on his face, and he had the <laughs> thickest accent in the world, and they had him yelling at the top of his lungs while music was playing and people were fighting, and I and I wanted to hear what he was saying. Uh, I had that problem too, which is why I, I, I watched it again specifically with subtitles on. Uh, I remember people having that issue with Matrix 2 and 3. Uh, like they couldn't understand Merovingian because his accent was too damn strong. It's a, I think it's a French accent for that, that actor. But uh, yeah. Was it the same actor? I didn't even look at the credits. Yeah, it's the same actor. Um, and I was really excited about it. I thought they were going to bring back uh, Monica Bellucci too. But, um, but it was just it was cool to see merovingian and i was like oh man i can't wait and then he was like i was like holy <laughs> i was like what i don't know what he said so uh so it, that like you said that whole scene was just a throwaway i was like okay it didn't end up super mattering uh unfortunately <laughs> he's mostly just complaining about how he used to be he used to have a great life and neo fucked it all up so he's here to he's here to repay the favor basically got it okay <laughs> I think if you want to read into it, because there's a lot of there's a lot of commentary about the Hollywood system. And I mean, God, the the fucking the the villain is called the analyst, for Christ's sakes. Um, <laughs> Good point. If if anything, you could argue that the Merovingian is an insert for like all of the Hollywood executives that were living fat off the Matrix and then got mad that the Wachowskis didn't want to just keep making that forever. Um, if you want to be really kind to the movie and it's and it's representations. Yeah. Um, and I could, I could see that. I mean, like they, they made those at direct references to Warner brothers in the film. Yeah. Which, which is pretty great. Um, yeah. Which, which is also which is the matrix awaken. Did you ever play the, the tech demo for matrix awakens? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I thought the tone of that was so weird and confusing. It was but having played matrix four or having watched matrix four. Now it makes all the sense in the world. Cause I think, Neo and Trinity are their like Matrix Four characters at the end of the film in that demo. The way that they talk to each other and stuff. Oh, okay, all right, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they're like weirdly self-aware and jokey about about Hollywood stuff. Huh. Okay. All right. I'm 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 going along with you there. I'm fine with that. I don't know that it makes it any better, but it's just something to think about, I guess. <laughs> um, the uh, the whole machine world thing it seemed like a lot for them to have to like penetrate the giant machine fortress twice. Did that not seem like a lot to you? Oh, just in, just in terms of to get Neo back and then also to get Trinity back. Like I was like that wouldn't this be more heavily guarded? I don't know. I mean, yeah, they, they tried to address that in the, the dialogue, right? They were like, we used our one shot to get you out. And then they come up with a whole heist scheme to do it again. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, I don't know. Was the heist, did the heist, was that cool? Was that cool for you? Mm, it didn't make sense. 
Uh, yeah, that's what I was really trying. I was really trying to be like, I want this to make sense. I, I really do. <laughs> the first movie is pretty clear about the rules about the, like it, it's so good at establishing stakes. If you're in the matrix and you die, you die. You have to get to a, like a hard line to get out. So it, mm -hmm. it sets up like so many good chase sequences based on those world rules. The rules of matrix four are a little different. Um, and they don't explain them explicitly, but I think like, you can't just leave. You still have to go to like a portal. You have to go to a reflective right. surface, which by the way, there's so much imagery in Matrix 4 about reflections. It kind of plays into that one and zero binary thing again. Mm -hmm. Like just, just the opening, there's code crawling down that says the Matrix. And then code crawls up to say resurrections, which, you know, Phoenix Rising. But like hmm. code never crawls up. Never, ever. Um, so that was kind of weird. Right away, I'm like, oh, what are they doing? They're on me again <laughs> and then the next shot is code reflected through puddles in the ground and it's craw crawling up because it's reflected right right and then the way that neo gets out of the matrix is going through a mirror uh he like he transitions scenes in the merovingian fight to like the dirty basement or whatever by falling through another mirror mm -hmm. so there's a lot of like i think you have to get to a mirror or a reflective surface to exit the matrix now or something like that you have to go through a, a, a portal, a reflective portal, to see the other world. Um, so based on that, with the heist and stuff, it's like they tried to set up the stakes of it, but it was really fuzzy. Like Trinity has to choose of her own free will. Once that happens, we can, like, I don't quite understand, having watched it twice now, I don't understand why they had to have bugs be like a surrogate. Right, That the, the, surrogate, swap. the surrogate part was the most, I was like, why? And I'm sure they explained it, but I still don't know. They kind of didn't. I think it was something like, it's almost like the Indiana Jones thing of like trying to swap the statue with the weight. I think they were trying to make it so the machines wouldn't know right away oh, that they were trying to get that, her out. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, all right. There we go. That's all I needed. And it probably <laughs> teed up probably teed up the like one of the cooler original science fiction or one of the cooler like visual shots of like trinity freaking out and her splitting into like multiple shadow images i thought that was a neat shot yeah yeah no th uh, okay that makes that makes a lot of sense that it's like you don't want the matrix to know that she's gone until she is already gone yeah you have her physical body out but yeah. she was still connected with the matrix because you like you can you can go into the matrix wirelessly but you always could that was kind of a thing in the old movies yeah yeah. So yeah, I I'm still a little fuzzed about that. I don't think they did a really good job of of yeah setting up the the rules and the stakes of of the Trinity heist. Um, Phobos asked, do you both feel that the robots slash AI had too much personality? I liked that. <laughs> I kind of I mean they were fun. taught how to be human by Neo, right? Um, I well were the you mean like the the one that looked like a an eagle or a bird and like there were a few other were they taught by neo is that why i mean that that was what i read from the the end of the third movie is that neo kind of merged his consciousness into the matrix to kind of teach teach he, they were he was basically integrating the human hmm. aspects of free will into the machines and teaching them how to feel and be human so okay. that they could coexist peacefully um i mean i'm assuming a lot there because they didn't really get into that but uh, I thought I, that's what I read into it is that the matrix has been around for a long time and now has hybridized with human consciousness. Uh, so it makes sense that they would be a little more quirky and human. I mean, in matrix one though, Smith expresses that he thoroughly resents being in the matrix. So they're capable of resentment and hatred and well, that's sentience, some form of emotion. Yeah. 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 Cause there, cause that was, we asked that, that was the beginning of, I mean, the matrix, they had machines had already been sentient for a long time at that point. Um, because they created the matrix. Uh, okay, yeah, all right, that makes sense. Um, somebody was asking, "How'd you like the new Smith?" I thought he, I thought he was great. I thought he did a great job. I, I wish that Hugo Weaving was there, but he wasn't. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a bummer. I mean, I thought he did a good job, but uh, Hugo Weaving, man, he's the best. Can't beat him. No, you can't. He is. He's a just a giant presence. And I actually, also, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, I, I don't even know if they asked him. I'm not even sure. I remember somebody saying that, that he was approached, but was unavailable because he was doing another shoot or something like that. Mm. 
uh that that was just an anecdote that i heard though i have no idea if that's actually the case yeah uh what were you gonna say i just i just thought on the subject of smith i thought his his presence in the movie wasn't quite very well justified it aside wasn't. from just You're yeah correct. yeah he's he's connected with neo in very spiritual ways um and and i guess based on the fact that there are a lot of programs that have been kicking around the matrix through its multiple iterations like the merovingian and all of his weird werewolf boys and ghost <laughs> boys and stuff uh it kind of makes sense that smith's consciousness still resided in the matrix somewhere i think probably it was more it, it had more meaning as being representative of like the creative process and how there's going to be a there's going to be a businessman in the room that's going to do the shitty thing or going to be that part of the conversation mm -hmm. that seemed to be more what smith represented in context of, re of resurrections but like he uh, he showed up once to just force some action and that's it and then he showed up at the end just to be like I really like being in the matrix and trying to take control of it. <laughs> yeah. I guess he was like, I have plans I and guess. this will ruin them. <laughs> and then he just leaves. He's like, all right, I'm done. See you later. And then just walks out of the movie. So he, it was too much like my motivations are mysterious. Cause I'm a jester. Right. For me, especially in a movie that's otherwise very intentional and deterministic with what it does and says. It's a, uh... It's funny you say that because that's how I felt. That's what they did to Hugo Weaving's character, I thought, in like Revolutions and Reloaded. Because in, in The Matrix, it's very clear what Agent Smith wanted. And then in, in Reloaded, it's, it's like, okay, he's, he now wants out, right? He now, and he's, he wants out and, and Neo's in his way. Is that what it was in Reloaded? He was trying to figure out why he was alive, <laughs> I think. See, this and is what I mean. It got it got really like uh, vague yeah. as as time well, went on. Philosophically, he just served as the counterpoint to Neo's existences having free will. Um, and I think he, I mean, he does a monologue before he fights Neo in the Burly Brawl, and he talks about how he he was given like life, but he doesn't know what to make of it because he doesn't know his purpose for living, and his the one that he's decided on is to kill neo that's that's all he can figure is that he right. lives to kill neo um so he that's that's basically what he's doing through matrix two and three but that means he's not a, he doesn't have sentience because he's slave to his purpose basically right 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 um and that so that that to me so like i i wasn't so when new smith pops up and is like i am bad and now i am good like i was kind of like i hey, whatever <laughs> i don't kind of fucking care like that's what he did before <laughs> Um, in two and three, he was, oh, okay. He was very, uh, you know, waxing and waning. He just kind of do whatever he wanted. So, cause somebody in chat was like, Oh, wasn't that weird? How he, and I was like, I don't <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what Smith did before. Uh, I, I always thought Smith was great in one and then two and three that he became a little more just, uh, wishy washy, but that's okay. Um, so here's a theory. Hmm. Maybe, maybe Smith in this movie is the, is the representation of the need to like insert action and stuff. Cause he just shows up and he's like, Hey, it's time to fight. <laughs> um, and, and before he realizes he's Smith, he's kind of that force in the context of Tom Anderson's life. He's the guy that's like, Hey, guess what? We're making matrix four, buddy. Right. You cool with that. You're good. Cause we're doing it. So get used to the idea. So yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's part of it again. Maybe Smith now just represents, the things that Lana Wachowski doesn't like about the creative process and working with big studios. Hmm. That's really interesting. Well, you touched on a, on a, another important point that I've seen a lot of people say is that uh, Lana Wachowski is talking about um, transition, specifically their transition uh, in this movie, which I believe also can be an allegory. I don't know if it's necessarily the uh, Lana Wachowski's allegory, but I have seen people say that it, that it, that it is and uh in four uh in in resurrections yeah um huh. and uh and like i was like huh like okay like that was and, and again something i don't know anything about so sort of relying on what people are are just sort of saying throughout the internet and i i was like okay i could see parts of this film 
acting as an allegory for that specifically, but I don't actually know that. Um, and I don't, I wasn't sure if you had thought about that at all. I mean, I thought about it. I, I, I don't know that the, the movie, you know, at large is specifically about that, but I think, I think the themes of like the fact that, that Tom Anderson and Tiffany don't look like what they know they are. They, they don't, they don't look like their soul. Hmm. Um, but they didn't know that. And actually, there's a really amazing scene if you watch it a second time, knowing that they don't look like what they look like, where Tiffany talks about, oh God, talks about asking Chad to look at the Matrix video game. And she's like, doesn't that character look like me? And Chad oh, laughs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because she doesn't look like that. Right. But Tiffany saw Trinity and knew that was her because she saw her soul. Right. Um, which is actually right. super sweet. Um, that that somebody could connect with somebody else through a work of art like that. Um, I think that's probably the strongest aspect of the movie that that could acknowledge or or talk about transitioning is that you know what you look like and you know who you are and you know what your soul is. Right. Even if your container doesn't look like that. Yeah. And you can fall mm. in love with somebody seeing their soul. But the way their body looks doesn't matter if you if you know what their soul is. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those, you know, love transcends all kind of things. Yeah. But I think specifically uh. in how it was treated in the movie, uh, put a very concrete aspect to it. Yeah, totally. I, I was, that was something that I, I thought I was kind of rolling around in my head as, as I was watching it, too, is it could be an allegory for that. And that's cool. Um, and I'm, I'm fine with that. Like, I, I think it's really interesting to watch an artist uh, work something out on a page or in a movie um, or having worked it out, then turn it into, you know, what their art is. Uh, and that's always, that's always really cool knowing where it's coming from too. I like to, I like to hear what artists think of their own art and how they've interpreted their own art. Uh, it's always I mean, fun. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. I, I love that hearing was... that. A lot of people do not, but I love hearing that. Oh, that, I mean, that's, that's the thing that I found the most invigorating about Matrix 4 is that it, a lot of, a lot of it was, you know, Lana Wachowski basically telling her experience to the audience through, through Tom Anderson. There was that, what is that one line where Tom Anderson and Tiffany are talking in the coffee shop and he references like the only, and one of the more specific lines he has is he describes the Matrix as keeping some kids entertained. Um, which mm. I thought was just like, damn, is that how they feel about how the world reacted to it? Is that, <laughs> is that like people are like, oh my god, the guns and the explosions, and the Wachowskis are just like, well, okay, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm glad some people had a good time with it. Kind of, yeah. kind of missed the bigger picture, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I was, I was super down with like the commentary, uh, in the movie, not only about that, but the creative process. Yeah, yeah, um. Yeah, I was along for the ride the whole time. I don't, uh, this wasn't something that I was, <clears throat> I, I thought since they were following up Reloaded and Revolutions, I didn't expect much from this film. Um, and so when I watched it, I was like, that was uh, about what I expected a little, a little better. And I don't know if you, I don't know if you were going into this with really high expectations and you were, and they were mad or what? I don't know. I was. I would have only been disappointed if it was a direct got it. crowd pleasing got matrix it, yeah. film. Yeah. Um, if it, if it was just like the same hero's tale with the same, like similar action sequences, like I always like watching action Don't get me wrong. I'm a huge fan of stunt work and action cinematography. Um, like I love the John wick movies. Absolutely adore them. So I would have been, I would have been happy on some level, but I'm so much more pleased that it was instead a more sincere, original and genuine expression. Mm -hmm. um that i feel like yeah it gave me a lot to think about um that's what i wanted i wanted i wanted the unexpected i guess and and it delivered uh and now now the problem is i've come to expect that out of every wachowski film so it's going to be an issue going forward i think but <laughs> all their films so far have have always satisfied that desire in me yeah and that, that i uh saren was saying lana's derisive response to the audience was kind of sad she didn't have to treat us like that. And I, it's interesting you say that because I, I see, I can see both sides. I see your side in chat because I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Like shitting on the audience, that kind of sucks. 
But then I, I can also see her side because if she didn't like the way it was received, I mean, like this is something Lawrence and I talk about all the time. It's like, you can't, you can't tell people how to interpret your creation. Once you've released it in the world, that's it. Uh, but you can still talk about what, how it makes you feel. Hmm? You can, you can still talk about, uh, what your feelings are toward the audience receiving in a specific way. Like you said, it's like just keeping some kids entertained. If that's not what Lana Wachowski wanted for their art, then it sucks. And she can say as much. Uh, so th- there's a fine, and this is the fine line with pop culture art is that if you're making art for a billion people, then you do actually have to think about the audience a little bit. <laughs> Um, well, I guess you know? that's that's the crux of it, though, Bruce. I don't think Matrix Two and Three are pop culture art. They are art. It's, it's fine art, actually. It's it's a movie that exists to say something without without really a whole lot of acknowledgement about how the audience will react. I and agree. that was Matrix Four. And, yeah. and honestly, I think one of the bigger virtues of Four is maybe making people more aware that not all art exists to entertain. It, it isn't all audience serving. Sometimes the best art is purely expressive. And you come to it because you want to know what the artist has to say, not because they are laboring to produce a fun ride for you. Um, and and for whoever said that in chat, I, I should acknowledge like this isn't a pointed response to what you said. Oh yeah, yeah I totally yeah, understand yeah. if you watch Matrix Four and felt like you were being uh, talked down to or whatever derided. Yeah, it's yeah. the Last Jedi thing. Except I got way more of that out of Last Jedi than I did this movie. Um, <laughs> Last Jedi seemed to have open contempt for like Star Wars. Uh, it did so, some, yeah, which, you know, yeah. could, you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I guess one of the things that bugs me, um, and this can even be in relation to like no way home is that people have by and large, and, and this is, I guess, just the realm of pop art, but people talk about a, a movie's value purely in regards to how entertained they were. Like, how good was it? Is it good? Uh, just because that's really all you can do with a Marvel film. How good is it? Mm-hmm. But not did it do anything interesting? Did it ask any interesting questions? Did it leave you with something to chew on? Because that's not what Marvel films are for. So it, it bugs me sometimes when people talk about movies with the assumption that the barometer of quality is how entertained most people were. Like, did it please as many people as possible? As though that's the only mission of art to please and entertain as many people as possible. When you do that, you only get pretty sanitized stuff, uh, pretty broad, non-specific stuff. So I was very glad that this movie did not do that um, or intentionally chose not to. I uh, completely agree with you, Lawrence. I'll, I'll counterpoint you here only because I agree with you, but then there's also a whole nother thing, which is if this was made to be fine art and not pop art, well then, Lana Wachowski doesn't need a hundred million dollars to make a movie. Yeah. Right. Because she took it. I mean, why wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, I, no, no. Well, totally right. Because she's earned it. Um, yeah. And, uh, and to was me, a hundred million dollar movie. No, I don't, I don't, whatever the, whatever the budget was, I'm, I'm, it was relatively high. I'm sure. Uh, I wonder, I wonder if maybe so, that explains some of the weirder action is that maybe it was a budgetary thing. They did what they could, but I don't know. Um, people are saying 180, 195, 200. Yeah. No I mean, shit. Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. man. Ooh. And so, th- and so this is, this is why if you want to make $90 million, holy yeah, shit. If you want to make a fine art movie, that's totally fine, but you're probably not going to get $195 million to make a film. And yeah. when, when you, when you make it at that scale, you have to please what? 400, exactly. $500 million worth of people. Um, in order to well, you make don't have to, you can take the check, <laughs> make a big movie and then walk right. away because you'll right. never get funded again. Um, that was You're, honestly yeah. my worry after like, after speed racer and fucking Jupiter ascending, I was like, Jesus Christ, they're never going to get to make a high budget movie ever again. Um, and I would still watch whatever they make, but I was like, man, they are not bankable names anymore. And somehow they keep getting funded. God bless. So I. You're yeah, right, though, Bruce. Because people is, care. That is the system. People care. Well, and that's the and that's that's what pop art is, right? That's why MCU is working. Um, is uh, oh, the box office is currently 106 million. Well, that's domestic, right? That's got to be only domestic. Well, also, also HBO, was, HBO, was HBO Max. Max Day One, yeah. Yeah, HBO so Max. That's gonna that'll that'll make its money back. I think uh, maybe. Um, 
I don't know, Bruce. <laughs> probably, they spent a lot of money on marketing, I'm sure. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it wouldn't Lawrence, surprise me if this movie lost money. Lawrence, as a as a completely selfish venture, meaning somebody came to Lana Wachowski was like, "Hey, you want to write a movie? It doesn't matter what it's about, but it has to be the Matrix." And uh, she was like, "How much do I get? 180 million? There you go. Yeah, let's do it." <laughs> you know, like, um, so it's it's interesting because I don't. Who knows if Lana Wachowski was like, "I would like to make three more Matrixes," or if she was like, "Fuck it, I'll just do this one." Um, well, the and, movie seemed to say specifically that Warner was going to make one regardless. So yeah. she decided she might as well be involved, which I loved. Which is by awesome. The way. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I lo- she, she made like a crazy art film instead yeah. of a crowd pleasing, like servile film that just tried tried to like one up all the things people liked about the originals. Yeah. Oh, by the way, it's it's 106 million <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> bad, mm. bad news. Um. So that so 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 uh that's sort of the that's the system that we're in which sucks um and and the the truth of the matter is we really we get to we get some really good stuff like i like i like lawrence that you liked this because you're right they took a lot of risks and i was excited to see them take risks rather than rehash like force awakens right i was excited to see that uh because i'd like to see something new that i because then i might get something new out of it and i might enjoy it um unfortunately this was not the fucking home run but it's kind of you can't write you don't generally write two home runs in your career like you don't write two matrixes right uh so i had low expectations for the film and if i were lana wachowski and they came to me and said hey you know write whatever script you'd like i would have been like you bet i'll do it uh because she doesn't need to please audiences anymore um and this is something i've talked a lot about with albums people like uh musicians writing albums where they have like a breakout album that's huge and then the next album they're like we're gonna produce the entire thing ourselves and it's shit (laughs) um and then they write it they release it and everyone goes boy that first album was great but this second album's trash uh it turns out it's because well you needed a lot more creatives around that group of creatives to make something great because they were looking to make the big the the I guess the best possible product in quotes, best possible product for the largest uh, audience. And so maybe that's why the second album wasn't as good. So it's kind of the same thing here is this one. Wachowski is not going to, they're you know, not going to hit another home run because she doesn't have to. <laughs> uh, and the matrix, maybe, maybe she felt a little more pressure to maybe, maybe she had a few producers or executives being like, but it's also got to be really fucking cool. Um, and she was like, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. And then this time around, not as much, which is okay, by the way. No big deal. Yeah, maybe. Um, that's that's the tricky thing is is you never know an, an artist's motivations, really. So it's sometimes it can be tough to judge at the success of a creative work. Like if, if a creative work was trying to be popular and it's not, then it, it failed, right? But if an artist just had something to express and they expressed their vision as fully and completely as they wanted to yeah. without regard for pub- public or popular opinion, then it was a successful work of art on those terms. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it, it almost reminds me of like David Lynch. David Lynch act- whoopsied and like got popular <laughs> because he kind of tripped into a zeitgeist. But he was never, ever the kind of director or writer that wanted to make film for everyone. He had a vision and if somebody was going to pay him to make it, that's great. And however it worked out on the tail end doesn't matter because his vision was the thing that you saw and it, it resonated with people sometimes. And then it didn't others, but he'll, he'll take whatever budget you can give him and he'll make his own thing. Um, and to some degree, I feel like that's kind of the same thing is, is sometimes artists who put their vision into the world, luck out if you can consider it luck some artists wouldn't that it actually does blow up into popular appeal and then that's when your art you have to deal with your art and your expression getting appropriated and misinterpreted and right, right. taken by people and you know a lot of that is obviously in matrix 4 so i've felt for a long time that and i think it's pretty clear from watching their films that the wachowskis if if they get budget they make their vision and 
if that happens to appeal to audiences, that's fine. But that's not their first goal. I feel like their first goal is expression. And maybe this is just an age thing, but I'm definitely getting to the age where I'd rather see expression than someone try their hardest to make me happy. Yeah. 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 That, that makes sense. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, I thought she succeeded. At, actually, I can say this. I thought she succeeded as much as I thought Ryan Johnson succeeded with Last Jedi. Hmm. Um, cause Last Jedi succeeded in subverting my expectations, just like the Matrix Resurrections did. And I liked both of them about the same, <laughs> which was like, uh, okay. And I walked out and said, yeah, sure. And then it kind of never thought about it again. So neat that they got to express themselves, <laughs> <laughs> but didn't vibe with me as much as, I mean, but I, I didn't expect it to vibe with me as much as the original matrix. I, it's okay. That's no big deal. That's a once in a lifetime thing. Um, hmm. So, and that's another thing too. I'm really apologetic when it comes to that kind of stuff too. It's like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, like I didn't hate it. This wasn't trash, but it was fun. And I like the, for all the stuff that you talked about, I liked that in the matrix. I thought it was cool. I thought the, the, the stuff that they were, that she was trying to do was neat. Um, and I appreciate it there. She was like, Oh, you know, like throwing in some fucking, some, Stuff that you're like, oh, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't like this. And I was like, okay, cool. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, all right, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, and it's the same with Last Jedi. It's like over and over and over. I was like, yeah, all right, Ryan Johnson, I'm with you. Let's go. And in uh, Rise of Skywalker, I was not. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's what, I mean, Rise yeah. of Skywalker is crazy because it, it followed in basically an art piece, an art film. If, if, if in the context of this conversation, an art film is one that exists for expression and not for audience audience satisfaction. It tried to like flip flop. It it went from an art piece that subverts expectations and expresses its own thing to going back to try to <laughs> pleasing yeah. people. Yeah, and yeah, that is such a weird thing, man. I don't know that that's ever happened before. But Matrix Wars made me think about Last Jedi a lot. Um, I don't know why, because mm -hmm. I reacted pretty negatively to Last Jedi. And in all the same ways I should have reacted neg negatively to Matrix 4, I think I think what it was is I, I never once expected, re requested, or like Star Wars was never that. Star Wars was never highfalutin, uh, philosophical, mm -hmm. anything. So I guess in this regard, it, it feels a little more appropriate given that there was a lot of that in Matrix 2 and 3 for it to, to continue on in its own way and for. Right. But right. yeah, I can, I can, again, I can definitely see why somebody would feel uh, condescended to talk down to all those things. Uh, yeah. That's a really good point. That's something I hadn't thought about until I was reading the chat and people were saying that. And I was like, gosh, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, Cause if people really liked bullet time and matrix, because I did, if they really liked it. And then a lot of chats was like, it wasn't about that then I guess you'd be like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't understand. You put it in the movie. Yeah. Can it be about both? Yeah. And that's, can it be about both? Thank you, Lawrence. That's, that's what I was heading towards. It can uh, be about both. And that's, that's, that's what I love. That's why I love Star Wars. That's why I love MCU. It, it can be about all of the things. It's really hard to do. Making pop culture art is really fucking hard to make everybody love it, but also tell a story and tell and have morals. And like, that's probably the hardest thing in the world to do. But it can do it. And it's really hard. Um, and I think some artists go the David Lynch way where it's just like, fuck it. I can do whatever I want. And then if you get something out of it, great. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some artists go the J.J. Abrams way where they're like, oh, I want to please everybody. And then they blow it. But there's a there's a middle ground that doesn't happen very often. But uh, but it's but when it hits, it is just otherworldly. It's perfection. Um, and I thought the first matrix did that. Uh, and that's, that's really hard to do. <laughs> so it's, sometimes it's an accident. Other times it's on purpose, but it's, it's very hard to do. And that's okay if you can't do it every time. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's the magic intersection where an art of genuine expression does capture the heart of the masses mm -hmm. and it does, it does wake people up, uh, to, you know, borrow the operative phrase from the movie yeah um yeah. and yeah it's it's like a once every 20 years kind of thing 
Um, yeah, that's really Star hard. Wars was that. Matrix was kind of new Star Wars. Well, Matrix One anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it absolutely was. Yeah, I think one of the things that I I because I I liked the movie the first time I watched it, but I felt a little raw that it seemed so cynical about the the legacy of the Matrix because you you know you have all these douche bros talking about how much it meant to them and really what that means is they thought all the shooting was super cool i was like well i mean come on the, you know there was more going on there what what i realized is when you escape the matrix in that movie suddenly it becomes so much more positive you know um they go to io and they're growing strawberries and humans yeah. and machines are living together yeah so i think the movie was acknowledging that in the matrix where people really like bland uh nor like air quotes normal lives they like going to their shitty jobs every day they love uh they love experiencing art on the most surface levels that's where everything is super cynical no one got the matrix there uh but out in the real world the matrix actually led to a wonderful explosion of things um i thought there was a really fun sort of dichotomy between there's that scene where the douche bro is telling tom anderson how much he loved the matrix when they were cheersing coffees and stuff like that and then there's a scene later where uh a character is telling telling trinity how much she meant to her and how cool she was and how that made her feel like brave and stuff but that was in the real world Mm. so i really appreciated how in the matrix everything is cynical and surface level and stupid outside the matrix everything is real and compassionate and constructive makes sense so yeah, yeah so to me that sets up kind of a new meaning for the matrix in the context of the story it just now represents living shallowly, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, th- I thought that was neat. Yeah. I like that a lot. All right. I, I absolutely take your meaning and I got that meaning as well. Uh, that's a great way to put it. So, well, that was it. I, just, I, I was just curious to ask you about these movies because I hadn't been able to talk about them with anybody. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, I talked about it with Steph quite a bit, but. I, I I could hear people's opinions on Matrix Four for a long time, a long time, because it's one of those where not only did not only did watching it like give me a lot to think about, but I'm gonna learn. Like I can't wait to learn more about people from how they react to that movie too, mm-hmm. positive and negative. I think I think everything's equally valid. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. Um, yeah, it's fun to it's fun to hear chat as well. That's, that's always gonna give different points of view that i had not thought about before so that's great uh, yeah. cool thanks lawrence i appreciate it 